Hello and welcome to Cage Fighting. It's your main man Andy Gillard here. Hope you're all keeping well this season. Hello everybody, Matt Guy here. We're well underway. Hope everybody is doing well at the moment. We're balls deep in the snow. Hello everyone. <laughs> After last week where you told off Matt, I say last week, let's be honest, we're recording this all on one night, We you <laughs> told Matt off for being crude and now you're talking about your balls in the snow. You've, you've never done that? Never put my balls in the snow, no, sure I haven't. You've never done like a, a snow angel and, and done it front ways? <laughs> yeah, Everyone's I, done that? Yeah, but this is, yeah. yeah this sounds like you're like teabagging the fucking snowman here, and like I just don't know. I've never done that. No, it's not been. Hang on, let's get <laughs> let's correct this already. There's no fucking snowman here. There's no the snowman hasn't been formed. It's just snow on the ground. You jump in, nothing on. Why are you you're saying that like own, it's mate. a normal thing? <laughs> it's, like why are you, you saying? Want... Everyone must have done this. That you can all say you haven't, but <laughs> I haven't done it. Andy, have no, you done it? Never. So when I jumped in a bush, complete when I stripped off and jumped in a bush at uni, I didn't realise it was a prickle bush and got, got all the all blisters all over my body. Well, one prick to another actually. Yeah, yeah I can say it was a prick bush afterwards anyway. It was very, very bad. <laughs> I mean thankfully as do is as was helping, so I took get some of the is it called Cal- calamine lotion? Cal- calamine, calamine lotion, lotion yeah. yeah. I had to rub that all over myself. You did put your clothes back on before going into Asda, though, surely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I was, because I was all itchy, so then I went to a mate's house and stayed in the halls. And obviously she was a lot smaller than me, so I ended up just having a dressing gown on. <laughs> Pink dressing gown. <laughs> oh, covered in it, oh, but shit. it was like I mean, a... This is not how Christmas supposed to be taught to me, is it, really? But, I bet it was like a little kimono on you. <laughs> <laughs> it was like Ken Barlow. <laughs> Can I, look, it's not Christmas related at all, but is every home complete without a pot of pseudocreme, which should have been used in that exact scenario? I swear, like, like yeah. someone could chop my arm off, and if you put pseudocreme on it, it will grow back. I mean, pseudocreme is absolute scum of the earth. I mean, especially when I mean, the amount of time. I mean, I've I bought two different rugs because of pseudocreme because you don't you don't come out. There's no way. There's, there's something in that. It it's like. <laughs> It's like an emollient, of, isn't it? It's yes, like uh... viscous oil. <laughs> <laughs> Are you putting this on babies to, to make them better? Because it burns it burns the wound away. It must do. I mean, that, that was the problem, though, because it had been left alone for two seconds, and then it it was all over himself, and he had to just put him straight in the bath. But then it's because it's so oil and sticky, it's scrubbing it. No. it, it Sudocrem is just, no, just ban it for life. Get rid of it. Look, they banned talc. Talc was better than pseudocreme. Yeah, it might give you cancer, but at least it didn't go everywhere. But everyone's at least done a, a, a Nagy Snow Angel in the life once. If you haven't, you're missing out. <laughs> Incredible. I do. I think we're getting a picture as to why Stu loves Christmas. So. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's more to his um, depravity than we realise. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is though, like you know, you, you you know, you do this little snow angel in the garden. Due to the natural climate, it's going to look like two acorns and a chipolata, like in the ground. It's going to be, you're going to be freezing cold. Can't be good for you. Mm. Yeah, but not if you stay there all the like. It's like when you when you lick it. Come <laughs> 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 on, on Stu, come on now. <laughs> you know when you when you when you got when you got an, I was gonna say, get, get, when you got an icy pole. <laughs> But clearly, in this situation, I had, um, and you like in um, Dumb and Dumber where he licks the thing, the um, the ski lift, yeah, and he gets stuck to it. After that film, we all did that at school. We all when when it was frosty, just to see where it happened. No, I don't no. lick random pieces of metal in the street. <laughs> <laughs> it's too risky, especially in the post-COVID world. Please don't no, do that. <laughs> no, do it in the comfort of your own home with your own metal. Um, not in not like street, but you, yeah, but you, you couldn't get because we did, street lamps back then they were all made out of concrete anyway. They were on metal ones, so they were all that weird kind of brownie yeah. kind of bobbly concrete. So there was nothing to lick there. So you had to li- <laughs> <laughs> you had to do, you had to do it at the railings at school, <laughs> like an opportunist. Oh, <laughs> Incredible, right? Okay. Um, 
<laughs> the big releases this week. There's nothing at the cinema. Um, it's probably both things which are happening on streaming services. So first off, we're getting the first episode of National Treasure, Edge of History. It has been reported that Nick Cage has signed on to appear in season two. And there has been a lot of rumours picking up speed of a third National Treasure film. Um, but it does seem unlikely that he's going to be appearing in this year's season of it. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, are we excited about this? Like I recently rewatched National Treasure. Um, it feels like it's the perfect genre for like a 10 episode unravelling of a mystery. Like I, it, it does feel like it's the right kind of TV series for me. So I, I'm really looking forward to this. Matt, Edge of History? Yeah, I think it's... <laughs> It's it's always going to be good viewing for nearly everybody because who doesn't like a mystery, you know, over and episodically as well that can end on a slight cliffhanger on you know episodes three, five, and seven at the end or whatever, and you've got people that are involved in the history element and there'll be people that just like it because of its appeal factor from the films from years ago. I I can't see anything unless it's just a shit quality TV show. I can't see a reason why this won't be enjoyable because it's got, you know, it's got the IP already and mm. everyone loves a bit of like a, an Indiana Jones rip off anyway, don't they really? Or mix that in with a, you know, an explorer and, and the history element. I think it's, it's got all the ingredients to be good. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously it's got some, some big Disney books behind it as well. So fingers crossed, this should be a winner. Stu thoughts on this one. Yeah. Can't wait. It's got the kind of from the trailers. It's got the kind of like the the Magnum and Hawaii Five O reboots that was on on telly in the last ten years. Yeah. It's got that kind of. It doesn't take itself too seriously, but it can explore real issues if it has to, um, and it's got that fun element behind everything that it does. So. And I loved all that stuff. I mean, I, I miss a Wi-Fi vowel really badly. <laughs> it was one of them things. It was one of them things that automatically I watch as soon as, as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, I'm right. I think you are right as well. Like you said, ten episodes is perfect for something like this. If this had co- if this had come out, what five years after the second film, it would have been twenty two episodes, and it would have been way too much. Yeah, and they would have spoiled it. But having it as a concentrated thing and knowing that it's it's got an it's got a story in this season and then there can obviously be more afterwards. I can't wait. It's gonna be great. We all know it's gonna be great. And if people are going in there criticizing it and which there will be because it's streaming, it's Disney and whatever, um, then just don't bother. Don't watch it. Just leave it yeah. to people who want to enjoy it like we we are, because and I'm still convinced he's gonna show up at some point. I think it's a it's all a big ruse. I'd be all for like you know the the end of even if it's just right at the very end of the whole season, where they just like the main character goes into a room and there he sat Benjamin Gates, telling her about we need to get I don't know fucking Abraham Lincoln's gun or something <clears throat> crazy you know just just a little nod to where we go in next I think that'd just be excellent I'd be all for that. Uh, the other. Big release this week is on Netflix. We're getting the stop motion Guillermo del Toro Pinocchio. Um, after the hammering that the Disney live action retelling one got, this one looks like the reviews have been much more positive. Obviously, it's very early days and it's not hit the screen yet. But, you know, Guillermo del Toro Pinocchio. Pinocchio is a little bit of a, you know, it's got that Pan's Labyrinth to it in that it's a fairy tale. But there is that undercurrent of actual fear to the storyline. I feel like this is the perfect fit, those two going together. Stu? What, why is this happening all of a sudden? Is it like, out of copyright now for, for some... Or like Winnie the Pooh is? Because why is everything Pinocchio all of a sudden? I think it's... Do you remember when like we had two um, Robin Hood films out in the space of six months? <laughs> I think it's just dumb luck. Or it could be that because this Del Toro one has been in the pipeline for forever and a day. So maybe Disney got wind of it and tried to beat it by doing their live action remake. But you got the the lives of P game as well, which is Pinocchio. Look, like steampunk Pinocchio. Oh, right. Okay. That's a, a new one. Yeah, on me. Well, steampunk Pinocchio slash um, Demon Souls, Dark Souls, that 
Elden Ring nonsense that he likes. Um, just fucking hell that stuff is. Yeah, just now. <laughs> it's never going to be touched. But yeah, well, like you, you just said it's summed it up perfectly. If it's anything like Pan's Labyrinth, then yeah. Don't care. Don't care what the subject is. If it's Gil and Toro being allowed to do his own thing, which this very much seems like it is, mm-hmm. it's going to be class. So yeah, all in on this. Mm. Even though I don't even like Pinocchio, I think it's it's stupid. But again, it's Gil and Toro, so yes. Yeah, I get you. I'm completely with you there. Have you watched much of the Cabinet of Curiosity yet? No, nothing at all. I've only seen the first two episodes and I watched the second one with my mum and she did scream with this bit with a rat coming through the ceiling. So I loved it. It was great. <laughs> Matt, have you got much of a penchant for Guillermo del Toro's work? Yeah, and I think it will lend itself very well to this to this because you're absolutely right. There's there's an undercurrent of mischief and, and weirdness about the whole story that can be explored if it needs to be. Like... It can be verging on not scary, but chilling. I guess would be the would be the word. Like it's a weird story in itself. Like you know, if they wanted to put Geppetto down as being a wrong and they could, they won't, but they could. Do you know what I mean? Like, or mm. th- th- there's, there's elements to this, or or, or the or morality and that that can be could be explored if they wanted to. And I think this world, the nothing there's nothing wrong with taking a slightly more, uh, how do I put it? Like creative approach to it, I guess where they just explore this in a, in a more cynical way than the, the shininess and the colorfulness and the loveliness of Disney normally. So, you know, I, I think this is kind of a, if you grew up on Pinocchio, now you're older and wiser and you hate the world a little bit more. So there's no reason why you wouldn't enjoy this now if they go down that route with it. Absolutely. I mean, it is, He's basically a nonce, is what you're saying. I'm saying it could be. It could. They could go down that route if they wanted to. <laughs> he's, a, he's a nonce who makes a boy and then sells him off. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Mm. There, there is certainly um, a story to tell there, I think. <laughs> if they go down like something really dark, like it's all there for them to, to play with, isn't it? The, the twisted minds of, of someone like Guillermo del Toro. I think this is probably going to be more family friendly than that. I would expect so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, speaking of family friendly, I thought this week would be the perfect one to discuss. What makes a perfect family friendly Christmas movie? And what film do you think is the embodiment of that? Stu? No, there's only, well, I was going to say there's one, but there's two either. And that's Home Alone 1 and 2. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> I think. Mean, it's it's that kind of, there's a fine line between being too kiddy and and not being kiddy enough. Mm. Um the Pixar films have got it down to a T, so you could choose any one of them. Frozen would be a lot of people's choice, obviously because of the snow and the songs and whatever. But an old school family f- <laughs> This would be classic. Well, it, I'm guessing it's called family fun or family adventure. Um, like you used to get years ago, like the, like the Witch Mountain films and stuff like that, where it's always and, and Goonies, <laughs> um, which is always it's normally based around a group of kids and actual mm-hmm. good kid actors, not shit ones, which makes a big difference. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, the, Home Alone and Home Alone Two have. And to be fair, bits of the one that came out last year, not much, but bits mm. of, um, they've all, they just nail it because I mean, how many years of, how many times have you watched Home Alone now? It's got to be upwards of like 20 now for me easily. 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 And every single time you still see something else still, and it's only an half long. Mm. How is this possible at this point? You know the script off by art, you can watch it. You can, I mean, I went through a phase, I mean, Goldie did as well, where he used to record things on his um, on mini disc and listen to, listen to films at work. <laughs> you can listen to it without watching it and know it like the back of your hand, mm. and you'll still get something out of it. And like now, I was talking to him about this yesterday when, when we're going to watch Home Alone, and Ethan's 11 now, he'll watch it. Corey's. Probably not going to watch it at five, but the point is that he could, 
and yeah. it'd be fine. And it'd work on every level because you got the silly slapstick nonsense of it all. You are the alcoholic mom, the the dad who's got some kind of dodgy job to have a house like that anyway in the first place. And then you got the two morons. So it, it's got everything, everything that you could want. Yeah. And it, 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 it's probably telling that, that nothing has come close to it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. It's, it's as close to Christmas perfection as it gets, I think. Matt, what about yourself? Well, I mean, for a family film, it's a tale of a family that doesn't care about their child enough that they leave him alone on multiple <laughs> occasions. To... <laughs> so as, as far as a Christmas family film goes, he did as a warning as opposed to anything else. Um, I think what makes a good Christmas family film is the innocence of a child being able to enjoy something and then the subtle nods and the silliness and dialogue that kids won't understand but adults will and kind of in jokes around that. So that's why I think A Muppet's Christmas Carol is probably the best yeah. because it's got both, hasn't it? It's got all the silliness that the kids will enjoy, but it's got the little side side eye glances and those kind of things that adults can enjoy as well and you know it's got michael kane and it's it's just it's perfect in that sense because it's a tale as old as time in scrooge and and everything else so you know it's great for that would i watch it if i was on my own probably not but if i had like young family around me or anything like that, then it's, it's just perfect to put on to keep them entertained. And you actually don't hate it either, like I would if I was forced to watch Frozen. <laughs> mm. We said about that as well, how the the definitive version of Muppet's Christmas Carol will be on Netflix, this, well, no, on Disney Plus this year at last, with the missing song, the yeah. first, first time in about 30 years. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So that should be out... Was it the 9th of December, did you say that was, Stu? Uh, I put the link in the other day, I can't remember. Yeah, it's... I think it was the 9th, so it should be out by the time this podcast goes out. So I'm, I am planning on watching that as soon as I get a chance. I, I love The Muppets anyway, and The Muppets Christmas Carol is... I mean, that probably would have been my answer, to be honest, had Matt not have uh, jumped in and, and stolen it from me. My apologies. I, I do love it, I think it's wonderful. You both touched on something, I think, with... Um, something about children in Christmas films, so... We've said many a time on this podcast about how shit children actors are in most films. They're terrible. But I feel like if you get a half-decent one in a Christmas film, it sort of elevates it almost. There is something about having the innocence of a child and them not being an absolute dog shit actor <laughs> ruining the movie. So that's why I think Home Alone works, is you did have like a proper bona fide actor in there. You didn't have some just fucking idiot who they're dragged in off the streets um which is why i don't know why but i think i would go for nativity because they have <laughs> just sort of found people off the streets randomly but there was something so wholesome and sweet about these kids possibly because they weren't really actors they were just people who went to a school who were happened to be chosen for for this film and it worked really well Plus, I, I'm a big fan of Tim from The Office. I think Martin Friedman is always really likeable in pretty much everything he does. He's got that everyman quality about him, and it really shines through in Nativity, which helps with you as the viewer because you identify with him. He's the person in the middle of Christmas time, and you're there with him almost. So I think Nativity is also like a very good family friendly film. It's funny and silly for the kids and it's funny and grown up for the adults like it's got a bit of both and it it, it manages to to walk the line really well between the two i think the kids would love oh uh mr i was gonna say mr hanky but that's south park um dan wooden's character whose name i think it's dan wooden i can't remember his character name i think he's really good but you've got martin friedman for the more grown up in you and I don't feel that any of the nativity sequels managed to strike gold I don't think any of the sequels managed to, to recapture lightning in a bottle quite like that first one did so yeah the first nativity wonderful film so that is another Christmas cast 
quick question minisode done and dusted please make sure you've got us on your podcatcher and if you want to subscribe to all of the socials at cage fighting part and any emails to cage fighting part at gmail.com for this week matthew would you like to say goodbye take it easy everybody look after yourselves i hope you're knee deep in festive food and drink by now so uh don't stop now take it easy Stuart, would you like to say goodbye <laughs> hopefully not knee deep in pseudo cream <laughs> just say that <laughs> <laughs> goodbye everyone it's goodbye from me and remember be excellent to each other <laughs> We'll be right back.